All right, so um, hi everybody, thanks for coming to this first of three events that the Haven Center, um, along with the Center for the Humanities, is generously sponsoring with Joshua Clover. Um, so today we have a four o'clock lecture, a four o'clock lecture or seminar tomorrow, and then on Wednesdays um, a noon seminar, which will be kind of more seminar style, less lecture style. So hopefully people will be able to make it out for all of those events. Um, uh, my name is Lenora Hansen. I'm in the English department, and I'm just going to give a brief intro for Joshua, um, which mostly just entails me saying that um, I kind of came to know Joshua Clover's name not as a poet or a critic, which he's obviously a very established poet and critic, um, which is nice for him and for other people too, um, but I came to know his name primarily through comrades and friends um, and fellow activists, which is a really nice way to get to know someone's work as a poet and a critic. Um, so I was introduced to Clover's name in 2011 from friends who knew him as a, as a professor who would show up to places, would sit down in places, would occupy places, and would blockade places. Um, and so that was kind of like how his name circulated around to me um, in Wisconsin at the time when we were also occupying things in 2011. Um, and since then, I've read a lot of his work. Um, one of the things that, if you're reading Riot Strike Riot, um, or other pieces by him as well, I think that you'll find is that um, there's ama an amazing kind of enthusiasm that his writing generates, which I think has a lot to do with a kind of feeling of um, the kind of both relief and terror of things collapsing and falling apart. Um, and then the kind of coming to and awakening um, and finding out that there are still numerous bodies around you and that you're moving on to go somewhere else together. Um, so that's the general kind of effect that I gather from um, Clover's writing. So um, if you haven't read his work yet, I highly recommend it, and this will probably be a good introduction to it. Um, and then now I'll read his like official bio, <laughs> which is, I'm probably something I'm supposed to say, which is that... <laughs> Joshua Clover, I know that it starts with Joshua Clover as a communist, yes. Joshua Clover is a communist. Um, he's also a professor of literature and cultural theory at the University of California, Davis. Um, a widely published and translated essayist, poet, and cultural theorist. His most recent books are Red Epic with Commune Editions and Riot Strike Riot, um, The New Era of Up Uprisings with Verso Books. Um, you can also read his writing on the images of Black Lives Matter, Buzz Lerman's The Get Down, and Pop Music as Anti-Police on the Nation's website. So without further ado, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Nora. Um, hi, everyone. I, I usually start. Uh, I'm gonna, the, today's talk is more or less an overview of the argument of the book, Riot Strike Riot, a book that's mistitled. Uh, more on that. Uh, I usually start with the song Fuck the Police by Lil Boozy. So, not the NWA version, but the Lil Boozy uh, version. I, I thought today I would start with Joni Mitchell for a couple of reasons. One, it's her birthday. Two, I discovered this morning via the incredible research skills involved in Googling that if you Google Johnny Mitchell Riot, you do in fact get results. Uh, and three, I'm feeling very stressed about election season. It's put us all through the ringer, and I find Johnny Mitchell very relaxing, more relaxing than Lil Boozy. Uh, so <laughs> I thought today, only today, I would take a break from the Lil Boozy regime uh, for Joni Mitchell, this, it, th uh, this song, and I'll just let it play through the intro, that'll, that'll be it, is, uh, it's just not relevant, the book has nothing to do with music whatsoever, uh, but I like music. Um, the, uh, this is her song, which is written, among other things, in the fallouts from the student and uh, civil rights black power struggles around 67, 68, uh, recounting sort of the destruction of a whole sort of social network that happened or the collapse of it after that time. So it seems at least a little bit apropos. The images I want to sort of play in the background uh, while I warm up my voice are all from November of 2014 um, and from the riots I refer to as Ferguson II. Uh, as many of you will know if you've paid attention to riots, Often there's two, uh, two riots around an uh, sort of instantiating event. So there will be the riot 
in the contemporary era, over and over again, when someone gets killed, often it's a young person of color, but not always. Uh, and that'll be the first riot. And then there will be another riot when the police officer or officers involved are not indicted or let go free. And so this is Ferguson 2 images when uh, the officer who, who murders Michael Brown is not indicted uh, uh, in, in Missouri, and there's riots nationwide. And in some sense, uh, this talk could be an attempt to think through one simple question, which is why all these riots took the same form over and over again, which is to say why, in depending on whose measure, in 30 or 40 or 60 or 80 cities, uh, every riot took the form of blocking the highway. And somehow just everyone knew as if by a kind of uh, total insurrectionary telepathy that that was what you were supposed to do. In towns that weren't big enough to have a freeway going through them, they blocked the biggest street they could find, Main Street, Church Street, whatever was available. Uh, and so the question of why that was the particular form uh, that those riots took, and if there was a way to think about that historically, is one of the animating questions for me. Uh, and so that can be sort of one thing that hangs in the air as I try and tell this sort of extremely long durée story. Now before I start, I should obviously thank uh, various people, um, Nora for the introduction, of course, but also for helping arrange this trip, along with Matt, uh, <coughs> along with the Haven Center, the Humanity Center, Sarah Geyer, uh, and everyone else who contributed. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And um, uh, I'm really happy to be here on this. I guess it's now turned gray, but it's been, it's been pretty beautiful, and gray has its own beauty. Uh, now, I've also, also the, given a few talks around this book, uh, we'll have a question and answer at the end, but I, I, I want to sort of suggest that uh, I'm, I can guess what some of the questions are going to be. Since I've started to get some of the same questions over and over again, that's very useful for me since I can discover what the, the sort of immediate puzzles raised for people are. So maybe I'll sort of try to proleptically address them a little bit at the beginning. So first, uh, I'm very interested in the question of revolution, but I am not making a claim in this book that riots are the royal road to revolution. <laughs> I do not know how to get from riots to revolution. <laughs> if I did know, we would not be here right now. We'd be out doing that. Uh, um, however, I think it's an important question what the sort of current dispensations of struggle and conditions of struggle how that might open up onto a broader um, political struggle heading toward revolution. And that's more or less what the Wednesday seminar is we're going to try and talk about. So I'm sort of hoping other people will come with answers and then we'll know. But that'll be a chance to talk about that set of questions. Uh, another thing I can say about this talk, um, it's not about China. I get this question quite often, which is sort of like, but what about riots in China? <laughs> riots in China are fascinating. There are excellent scholars who spent their careers trying to understand social struggles in China and social struggles in India. I really did not want to sit down and read through the archives for four months and pretend to be an expert. Uh, the argument I'm going to make today is almost entirely about the early industrializing nations, as I call them, uh, where the Industrial Revolution first takes hold and where capitalism, as we understand it, takes off. So really, Western Europe, the United Kingdom, the United States. Uh, are the fundamental locations for the, my research and the study I've done. I don't want to seem to make claims that everything is totally universal, true in all places and all times. That said, we now live in a fairly integrated global structure, so I think that the kinds of consequences we're seeing at local levels can't be disentangled from a global economic or political economic arrangement. Uh, but I don't want to make any dramatic claims, and if you want to know about riots in China, I highly recommend you read Ching Quan Li and various other scholars who are excellent on this. I'm happy to give names and references. Uh, a third thing I should say, uh, and I realize that my own sort of personal history of political involvement that Nora alluded to muddies the waters a bit. The book does not advocate riots. It's not a work of advocacy at all. It's simply an attempt to understand this basic question of why We've seen this transformation over the last 30 or 40 years away from labor struggles and toward 
riots uh, in the early industrializing nations. And to give an account of what that is, that's one side of the book's argument, is to try and make an account of that fact. The other side of the argument is, by making that account, to try and sort of give a history of capitalism in the West and to understand where we are within that trajectory uh, of the history of capitalism and what riots or the return of riots, the rise of riots, can tell us about that trajectory. Uh, and the, probably the last thing I should say is I've come to understand that the particular way I use the term circulation in the book is puzzling to some people. So in the middle of the talk, I'm going to have a little um, discourse on Marx's ideas of circulation. It won't take too long. To some of you, it will be remedial and boring, and I apologize. <laughs> um, but it might be useful and hopefully will clarify the way I use the term circulation uh, over the course of the book and in, in the analysis. OK, I think that's probably enough for preludes. So let's move into the talk. Now, the last thing I should note is the three conversations that I'm having with people in Madison, including this one, they sort of build on each other. I hope they'll each be freestanding. I hope that if someone doesn't come today but comes tomorrow, it'll still make sense to them. Uh, but they do build on each other a bit. Uh, so uh, should you come tomorrow or the next day, it'll be sort of easier and easier sledding. Uh, and hey, Sarah. Hey. Um, it'll be easier and easier sledding. And consequently, today's talk, which is trying to set out the basics, the categories, the main concepts, is the longest of the talks. I hope it won't be so long as to bore you. Uh, it'll probably be about 45 or 50 minutes, depending on how much I wander. I, I'm trying not to read directly from a script. It's a couple times I'll refer to my notes, and that means the time is a bit variable. But I just want to sort of assure you that if it seems like it's going to go on forever, it won't. Everything ends, including capitalism. You can rest. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the few things we can take refuge in in these dark days. Um, this is, a, uh, for me, one of the most useful charts I've ever seen in my life. And uh, it's, it's one of the frameworks of the book. Some of you will recognize it, some of you won't. It's from Giovanni Arrighi's book called The Long 20th Century, uh, in which he lays out four, for him, cycles of accumulation, which is to say ways that the world system is organized around a single sort of leading economic uh, and military political power. Uh, uh, that sort of leads a long cycle in which capitalism does, or proto-capitalism in the early examples, does very well, increasingly well, and then sort of maxes out, reaches its limits, turns over and over again to financialization. That's one of his great discoveries, right? That the turn to financialization wasn't invented in the United States in 1973. It's a long-standing historical phenomenon uh, and that happens to sort of all these cycles. And so this is more or less the framework that I use and within this framework, uh, you know, I mark out my sort of three main periods, which are those, as the periods uh, in which you have these leading tactics. So Charles Tilley uh, offers us this category of repertoire of struggles, a repertoire of collective action. He notes that uh, uh, any given sort of society or collective tends to have a repertoire of ways they struggle to transform their lives or to deal with grievances or so on. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the sort of first period that I'm looking at, uh, the, the, the riot is the predominant sort of uh, form of struggle, but not the only one, sort of the orienting form uh, in the repertoire of collective action. Then we have the period of the strike, and that seeds again to the riot uh, somewhere in the 60s or 70s. Um, again, I want to stress, since I don't appear to be, or don't want to see, hurt, be heard to be making absolutes, we still have strikes to this day. Um, there were riots all throughout the period of strike. I'm not making some magical claim that everyone rioted, one day they stopped, everyone started striking, one day they, that's not the claim. It's about sort of orienting forms, the leading forms that people go to, so that when we look at the collapse of the labor movement in the West since the 70s, it's quite dramatic whereas there's been a notable rise in strikes, uh, both in their number, i uh, sorry, in riots, both in their number and in their scale, um, although data is imperfect. And if people want to get down and dirty about data collection on this topic, it's an interesting conversation, which I'm happy to have. I'll touch on it uh, once or twice. So that's more or less the periodization. I want to highlight a couple moments in it. 
One, I'm really particularly interested in the moments of transition. Right? So the first transition from uh, riot to strike, which we can associate with machine breaking, a sort of very interesting intermediate form, which looks quite riotous and destructive and chaotic, but is directly addressing labor issues and particularly unemployment issues and technological unemployment for the first time, which are the fundamental questions of uh, social struggle in general. Uh, and then in the, the second moment, the, the transfer back, you can see sort of the decline of the labor movement and the rise of riots. And in fact, that moment, that second moment, is the subject of tomorrow's talk, where I'm going to try and talk, rather than this vast, long durée, about a very narrow window, about two years uh, in the United States, in which the transition sort of is at a balance point. Um, and it's unclear how, which way it's going to go between sort of labor and labor struggles and sort of insurrectionary riotous struggles, uh, particularly in uh, Midwestern cities and particularly with racialized populations. So that'll be tomorrow's topic. I also want to note the very earliest moment, uh, somewhat absurdly, I claim the first riot happens in 1347. I want to assure you that that's not true. <laughs> but neither is it false. It's sort of an interpretive move, which is to say, there have been risings of the poor since there have been the poor. Uh, and the question of whether one can distinguish riots from risings of the poor is an important one. I think you can. It involves definitions, and I'm going to come to definitions in a second. I locate the first rise in 1347 for a couple of reasons. There's actually two in 1347. Uh, these two ships are being sent from England to France filled with grain to supply uh, soldiers who are in the middle of fighting the Hundred Years' War, uh, and uh, hungry people in the, in the two port towns uh, climb on the boats and seize the grain and remove it from the boats. Uh, that turns out to be the fundamental feature of riots for centuries after that, having to do with grain seizure, seizure and having to do with circulation of goods over and over again. And I'm, we'll end up arguing that the precondition for a riot in this sense is the emergence of national and, and uh, world markets. That they have to do with the existence of these national and world markets, which then make it possible to ship staples out of the county, out of the parish, out of the town, and, and, and cause people to think maybe we should stop that from happening. Uh, and, and that is sort of distinct from uh, various rises of the, of the poor. So um, it's also uh, an interesting date for reasons I'll 1347, for reasons I'll, I'll come back to. N Amazingly enough, the, the punchline is not the plague, uh, <laughs> although that, that figures there as well. But so that's my sequence, Riot, Strike, Riot, which is the title of the book. Um, so I want to sort of talk about these uh, for a second and the logic of them. The first thing I should say in this trajectory is my argument is that each emerges from the last. It's not simply an, uh, an opposition, riots versus strikes, strikes versus riots, but that the form of the strike actually emerges from the form of the riot. Uh, to clarify that, I'll have to get to a second argument about circulation and production, but <coughs> it's quite notable that the very first incidences of strike all happen exactly within that sphere of shipping of goods around, which you notice is that feature I pointed to for early riots. So they're all, in fact, in, uh, in uh, shipping commerce, or the, all the first strikes across the Western world uh, before, they, before they move into the factory with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and uh, then in the, the next period of transition, the, the sort of new riot uh, emerges uh, out of the strike, and that's sort of the argument I'll try and make tomorrow. But the thing I should note is the return of the riots, the new era of riots, is not identical to the first moment of riots. It's not a simple oscillation, where there were riots, then we went to strikes, then back to riots. And that's why the book is confusingly titled. The, um, I don't need to narrate the entire debate with my publisher, which I lost decisively, uh, <laughs> but in the later moments of it, when you know, I was being told the book would be called Riot, Strike, Riot, I was like, well, that's not really the the, uh, the argument, that sort of just suggests this historical oscillation, and my argument is this ongoing transforming dialectical emergence, um, and in the book, in fact, I describe the sequence as riot, strike, riot, prime. Oh, I think I have a little prime symbol. Okay. Does, that, does that come up? Possibly not. 
Oh no, now we're getting ahead of ourselves. Oh dear. Anyway, yeah, so that's the light bulb. It doesn't work. So it's supposed to be riot, strike, riot, prime. And I said, well, can we call it that? And, the, and the, my, my publisher was, uh, uh, I, I, he mocked me. <laughs> um, he would say, that's a, that's a subtle distinction for like 12 Marx nerds. Um, and and <laughs> um, we're not really marketing to the 12 Marx nerds because I think the implicit claim was that the Marx nerds were suckers and would buy the book anyway, and so they didn't need to be marketed to. It was hard to tell the discourse, but again, I lost. Um, but the second era of riots, I end up referring to as, some, as what I call surplus rebellions, and I'll try and clarify what that category of surplus rebellions means uh, in a little while. Again, the, another way to formulate my fundamental question, my first question was, why do all those riots in 2014 look that way? My second question is, sort of a larger meta question, what's the rupture and what's the continuity between the first era of riots and the second era of riots, riots prime? In what way is it even the same category and does it make sense to, to call them both by the same term? And in what ways, in fact, does that brutally misrecognize the situation? I think the first obvious question one would ask would be, well, that first era of riots you're looking at mostly doesn't appear to be racialized in various ways, whereas the contemporary era of riots, riot prime, almost without fail, we identify as being racialized. In Europe, they call them suburban riots, which is a term at first they didn't recognize until I understood that meant that immigrants lived in the suburbs of towns and with immigrant populations that were rioting. So it's the same sort of phenomenon of racialization under a different term. So the question of the relationship between riot and riot prime is maybe the meta question of the book. And uh, in getting toward that, I'm going to have to work through, and I had to work through some sort of definitions of the terms. Now, the first thing I encountered is that the definitions available of riot uh, in the standard texts are terrible, <laughs> astonishingly bad. And I want to note a couple basic problems with the definitions. Over and over again, the thing that orients the definitions is disorder, violence, no, that's it. Disorder and violence. Uh, well, there's more. In fact, the key word often is, is tumult. The Italian word for riot remains tumult right to this, to this day. The term tumult appears in codes around riot going back at least seven or eight centuries. People are very interested in the sound. That seems like a whole other book, right? Sound and riots. And someone should write that book. Someone who does sound studies. Is there any sound studies people here? Write that book. Uh, um, but so these are the sort of ways that riots are generally classified. They usually involve what we would call today conspiracy, uh, which is to say that often in the legal codes there has to be at least three people involved in a riot. Over and over again, it's suggested that you need 12 people for a riot. I cannot fathom why 12 became a legal magic number, um, uh, but it did. It's sort of interesting, right, that, that image of like 12 uh, people beyond the law, totally disorganized, running riot is like the magic dream inversion of a jury, right? Which is like the 12 people who are totally like immobile in a box um, executing the law. So there, there's something strange there. But here's why I think it's, we end up with a, sort of a terrible definition. One, it begs a question around whether riots are violent and wants to define them that way. Some of you will know the contemporary debate, which I want to assure you, if you think it's contemporary, it goes back centuries, about whether property destruction is violence. Because if, if, uh, if, riot, if, if violence is only harming other people, many, many riots are not violent. Many, many, many riots. Implicit threat to people, consistent feature of riots. Actual violence, limited feature. Violence to property, very common feature. At some point, in fact, it becomes agreed upon, it's like these social agreements, we don't know where they come from, that people should break glass uh, as part of it. That's interesting. Isabel Armstrong has a great book, which is not about riots, but it's about the history of glass architecture, but she has a great chapter on what she calls uh, the grammar of glass breaking, uh, as, a, as a sort of moment indicates a, a riot's going on. So, but often, they, you know, the, it, um, if you don't identify destruction of property with violence, it gets much harder to classify riots by that term. The other huge problem is the fact that, in fact, historically strikes, some of you will know this, are insanely violent. Our contemporary image sets them really in opposition, right, where 
riots, people are running wild and breaking things and hurting each other and setting stuff on fire. Uh, whereas strikes are almost like ascetic, right? Like they're all about like not moving, not doing, downing of tools, um, refusing to move. And that sort of that opposition is like ideologically powerful. But of course it's, it's nonsense. If you, one can name just a few examples. There's two riots in uh, Toulouse in France in, in 1831 and 1834 that involve they're so intense, they involve barricade fighting, the army is sent, massive death. You think about the Colorado Coalfield Wars, they end up in the Ludlow Massacre, right? That's an example of a strike. And there's endless examples of like strikes that essentially turn into uh, massacres, wars. They're, they're, they're historically extraordinarily violent. So that distinction just won't work. It just does not work. There's much better distinctions in the world. And like any serious scholar, I did the responsible thing and stole mine from a great scholar which E.P. Thompson, E.P. Thompson has this essay called The Moral Economy of the British Crowd in the 18th Century. Has anyone ever read it? I'm just curious. Has anyone read this essay? It's one of the three greatest essays humans have ever written. I'll tell you the other two for a small fee later on. Uh, and uh, in it, he starts to set out a distinction between strife and riot. He pretty uh, successfully discredits the historians and economists who want to write riots off as sort of spasmodic, inexplicable, disordered violence. And he has a quite different account of it instead. Here's the distinction he makes. Riots, he says, and he's talking about the first era of riots. He's talking about the 17th and 18th centuries. Riots are struggles over the price of market goods, and strikes are struggles over the price of labor. It's actually pretty simple. You can complicate it a little bit more and sort of argue, like, sort of discuss like who's taking part and how, but it would be a repetition of the same thing. So that strikes involve workers appearing as workers, in their role as workers, right? Whereas riots, they might involve workers, but they're not appearing as workers. They're doing something else. Uh, and so it allows sort of a different aggregation of populations. The, the population of riot and the population of strike are meaningfully different. And this is a fact we'll have no choice but to return to. So what does it mean to say riots are a struggle over the price of market goods? It's actually quite a persuasive claim. So one way to think about it is the category of reproduction, right? Which is to say every person, every family, every community has to reproduce themselves, not just biologically, but in the sense of right, having enough food and shelter and medicine to live from day to day. That kind of. So one, one way you reproduce yourself is in the marketplace by buying goods. One way you reproduce yourself is by working and getting a wage to go to the marketplace to buy goods. Uh, so these are two different ways of, of reproduction. And they're they often intersect. So we can think about riots and strikes as two different ways to address uh, moments when reproduction, the, the capacity for reproduction, for subsistence, is threatened. So for example, if you get in a situation where you can't afford the basic goods you need to live, let's say bread. Bread is always the example. There's good reasons for that. Uh, so there's a reason that the riots in the 16th, 17th, 18th century are almost all bread riots. They look like this. The people get very hungry. They discover they can't afford basic subsistence. And the second most common form of riot in that period is they go down to the baker and they say, you need to charge less for your bread. And if you don't, we're going to seize your bread. And the bakers then make a perspicacious decision, or they do not. Uh, um, <laughs> And right, if the baker says, like, you're right, I'm lowering the price of bread, riot's over, usually. Um, no violence, right, just an implied threat of violence. Uh, sometimes the baker says, no, I'm not going to lower the price. And then the bread gets seized. Sometimes the you know, store gets looted. Sometimes the, the bakery gets burned, but not always. Um, there's often a declaration that the riot's going to happen. This is one of my favorite sort of, like, minor facts. Uh, it's interesting to note that over and over again, women lead these riots. I think for reasons that are pretty clear, women are often in this period in charge of reproduction of the household, right? They do the reproductive work of various kinds, and they're more aware of what time <laughs> the marketing situation presents. And, um, and so they're sort of, they sort of know when it's no longer possible to solve subsistence problems this way, and they will initiate a riot. And often it's, sim it's signaled, uh, and someone will take a loaf of bread, and attach it to like a fishing pole, right, or something like that, and paint it black. 
and holds up, in fact, this is the origin of the anarchist black flag, as far as we can tell, is these painted black loaves of bread being held up to indicate riots. It's one of my, uh, a nice historical fact. And sometimes, indeed, they get smeared with red as well. And the first red and black flag we have any record of in, the, in, in uh, history is, is these loaves of bread uh, being hung up. So that's the second most common form of riot in that period. Here's the most common. It's similar but different. It involves blocking wagons. So it's the same thing where a merchant, not a baker, has decided to sell grain, uh, to ship it out of a town where there's uh, famine and poverty, to sell it for a higher price, and the people of the town go get in the road, and they block the road, and they say, we strongly recommend, <laughs> Mr. Merchant, that you do not ship this elsewhere. We suggest instead that you bring it back and sell it at a fair price, uh, or we'll, so you get, the, you get the logic, right? <laughs> or we'll seize it. And that's what happens. It comes back and gets sold at a fair price or it gets seized. So this is what Thompson calls price setting. It's pretty hard to argue with that that's what riots do for hundreds of years is price setting. Price setting of market goods. And then the strike, there can be little debate, right, works in the complementary form. It's the price setting of labor. Sometimes it's, uh, the strike is over working conditions which more or less comes down to the same thing, right? How much money do you deserve for eight hours of misery or nine hours of misery? How intense is that misery? Let's measure it. Uh, so, uh, so these are the two modes, right? Price setting in the market, price setting in the, the place of work, let's say the factory, right? It's a paradigmatic form, but obviously not all industrial labor happens in the factory. Uh, and that historical distinction works really well for a long time, uh, quite effectively in, in this sort of... Uh, uh, way that it happens, and this is what allows me to develop sort of my larger categories than riot strike riot, which is a different sequence, which I refer to as um, circulation production, circulation crime, as describing a long arc of capital. So uh, the thing I, I sort of wanted to work through was the idea of the riot as a circulation struggle, the strike as a production struggle. Now, they're certainly not the only kinds of, of circulation and production struggles, uh, but they're the leading kinds. And to work through this, I'm going to do, as promised, a sort of brief, like, what do I mean by circulation? So, uh, so in the account of Marx, although it's not unique, right, really a lot of this is borrowed from Smith and Ricardo. He makes his own small changes on it. For the average person, the proletarian, life is CMC. Commodity, money, commodity. We start with a commodity, which is probably our labor. We sell it for money. We use the money to buy commodities we need to survive. Food, bread, right? Great. And that's our life. On and on we go. CMC. It's great. We pretend it's something else, but basically it's just CMC forever, and then we die. That's, I, that, that may be the most depressing thing I say today. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But of course, for the capitalist, and again, I know that many of you, this is like brutally obvious. I'm just going to go through it really quickly. For the, for the capitalist, it's reversed. The capitalist starts with money. They buy commodities, which is usually labor power, and then input goods, right, means of production. They put those together. They make a finished commodity, and they sell it for money. So they have a different sequence, but for them, right, it's MCM prime, which is to say, they need there to be more money on the back end than there was on the front end, or why the fuck would they do it, right? It's a lot of effort to go through this whole, like, buying people's labor and buying wool just to make sweaters if you're going to sell them for the same amount you started with. <laughs> no one's going to do it, so they're going to end up with more money at the end. So this is the magic formula uh, of, of capital for, uh, for capitalists, and it has two moments in it, right? The first moment, as we talked about, um, is the moment of turning money into commodities, and then the second moment, exchanging those commodities for more money. And those moments define the two spheres of political economy as Marx understands them. Which we can sort of drop down. I know the lights are a little bright here, so it's a little bit hard to see the lines. But those are the two big spheres. The first is the sphere of production, when money is being exchanged for commodities, and those commodities are being worked. And then when the commodities are sold, that's the sphere of circulation. So circulation includes selling, the marketplace, uh, all kinds of exchange, but also consumption. Uh, so when you consume an apple, 
you're extinguishing the value, and it comes out of circulation, it doesn't go back into production except as your labor power. Uh, but, so those are two separate spheres, obviously they overlap and have to overlap. If I was going to get really fancy, I'd put a commodity in the center there, right, which is a picture of, I think Marx always uses a coat, right, but you get, you get the logic that there's a period of production and then a period of circulation, and it goes back and forth, back and forth between them. In the sort of sphere of production, you get valorization of commodities, which is they, they take on value, which can be later exchanged and generate surplus value. Uh, and in circulation, you get the realization of that value. So you can't produce any new value in circulation. This is actually a crucial point, uh, which people overlook. In circulation, you cannot produce any new value all you can do is realize the value uh, generated in production. So as a result, you get surplus value in production and profit in the sphere of realization. They're not the same thing. But here's the funny thing. We're interested in knowing this because we like political economic theory in this room, but capitalists don't care. Right? There's no capitalist in the world who sits around going like, well, so choose between surplus value and profit, which is this? They only measure in profit, right? All capitalists do is like, do I end up with that M prime? Was that more money at the end than I began at the beginning? Whether it arises in production or arises in circulation, seriously, no one cares if you're a capitalist. Um, but that not caring turns out to have significant consequences, which is to say, um, capitalists will compete to increase their profit in ways that eventually will undermine their capacity to generate the surplus value on which profit rests in the first place. That's a whole lot of, uh, that's chapter 25 of Capital, and you have to read the 24 chapters before that to get there. So that can be a separate project, but that's sort of uh, a short thumbnail. Now, what's particularly important for me to stress is that these two spheres are not just sort of technical relations. They're uh, social organizations as well. So if we think about the social organization of production, it's like it's, so it's not just like a specific act, I make a shoe and I'm transferring value to it and so on and so forth, but it's also a whole social arrangement, the arrangement of production. So if we think about, for example, division of labor. Right? Division of labor is technical in the factory. One person works on fenders and one person works on wheels, but it's also generally social. So certain kinds of work happen in one town, certain kind in another town, certain kinds of work in this part of town, certain kinds of work in that part of town. This class lives here, this class lives there. The, there's like a, a kind of social geographical division of, uh, of sort of all of your life gets organized by the needs of production and the needs of circulation. Now there's another way to talk about these two categories, um, which has to do with what I referred to before, whether you're more directly dependent on the wage or more directly dependent on the market. Now, if you have a job, you're more directly dependent on the wage. That's where you get your subsistence. You get a wage, and you go buy stuff from it. Um, and your life, that's sort of centered in the sphere of production. But what if you don't get a wage, but you're still market dependent? Well, then you're in the sphere of circulation. And this is uh, sort of the nub of how, of how I understand circulation. Circulation is the name for the social regime in which, you can, in which someone is market dependent, but does not have direct access to the wage. Uh, and that can start, sort of maybe get us back to our initial periodization, which I want to have here, where in that first period, this is the period of rising market dependence. Before a certain, uh, before a certain moment, right, you, I imagine you've read many of the histories, potted and otherwise, um, in which there's a lot of subsistence farming and sort of uh, People don't necessarily have to pass through the market to survive, but then you get the enclosures, the privatization of a lot of things, and for the first time you generate vast populations, and again, this happens first in the UK. I think Robert Brenner probably has the best history of this, but many people have good accounts. Uh, you get a vast population that's market dependent uh, for the first time, that starts to get a significant portion and eventually almost all of their subsistence goods by purchasing them in the marketplace. So that's the sphere of circulation. The market is the center of the sphere of circulation, sort of the social life of circulation. And then with the Industrial Revolution, you increasingly get people who are wage dependent, but more and more intensely wage dependent. Uh, and the sphere of production 
comes to dominate the arrangements of capital. Now again, they're both always present. There's always circulation and production. That's, like, that's the law of, and so I get to make my favorite gesture, dialectics. <laughs> um, uh, right? There has to be a dialectical relationship between circulation and production. They both have to be present. The question is, which sort of dominates or orients a society, market dependence or wage dependence? So in that first period of sort of blue or violet or whatever color my computer has given me, um, <laughs> that's a generalized market dependence and rising wage dependence. Then we have more or less the period from the Industrial Revolution where we have rising uh, wage, like generalized wage dependence, which takes dominance, and then you start to get something else that happened in that last period, which is what will come to you in the last movement of the, the talk, um, is what happens in that uh, period, which is a shift back away from production-centered economies to circulation-centered economies. So now maybe you see the larger shape of the argument that riot strike riot actually maps onto a political, so that forms a struggle, maps onto a political economic history of capitalism in the early industrializing nations, which bears circulation, production, circulation. As, as the sort of orienting force within, within the full structure uh, of capital itself. And of course, when I, call, when I say thus, we can think of a riot as a circulation struggle. So what do I mean by that? A couple of things. One, it happens in the space of circulation. Right? It doesn't happen in the factory. It doesn't happen in the mine. It doesn't make demands on those places. It happens over and over in the marketplace, in the streets, in the port, in all these places where circulation dominates. Uh, and, but we can say, like, well, thus, there must be other kinds of circulation struggles that intervene in that space. The blockade, the occupation, right, the barricade, all of these are circulation struggles. And along with the strike, we have other kinds of production struggles. Sabotage, um, work to order, all these various other strategies to sort of try and control the space of production and control how it works. So we have circulation struggles and production struggles of which the riot and the strike are orienting forms. And that's sort of, in some sense, the broad scope of my claim. In fact, I could end here. But I want to convince you of something which is hard to convince people of, which is that there's been this shift to circulation in the recent period, which explains why we've had a shift back to riots. Uh, so what does this shift to circulation look like? We can sort of start to get some sense of it. And here's this, this is like charts and data. This is, after all, sponsored by the Social Sciences Center, so I felt obligated to <laughs> offer some charts and some data. Uh, these are manufacturing net profit rates for the leading industrial economies of the 20th century, uh, which is the US, Japan, and Germany. You can't really make out the details here, but I will give you the classic salient fact. This is a slightly complicated sentence, but it's not impossible. Stick with me. For these economies, and there's an arguable debate about what happens in the first tech boom in the late 90s, but let's leave that for a second. In these economies, the best year after 1973 is worse than the worst year from 1947 to 1973. So that's the long boom. In the long boom, the worst year is better than any year that comes after it, in what, what we can call the long bust or the long crisis or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so that's one way to think about the kind of transformation we've seen away from what oriented the Industrial Revolution, which is manufacturing industrial profit rates. So what have we seen instead? That's one example, but there's a bunch of other ways to sort of conceptualize this shift away from traditional production. So one of them is uh, sort of restructuring of what kinds of labor people do uh, in this chart. Sorry, I'm moving now. Uh, <laughs> In this chart, we see the endless rise of services, the massive collapse of agriculture with the Green Revolution. In that period, there's a huge shift of labor from agriculture to industry. The greatest transfer of labor in the history of the world happens 19th, early 20th century, the shift from agriculture into industry and services. Um, industry sort of peaks there uh, and declines there, so that's one way to think about it. Of course, we also think about it as financialization. as another sort of mode of circulation. And I want to assure you, this is not an argument I can have now, but if you want to come out for drinks tonight, we can draw it for like seven hours. Finance produces no surplus value in this world. It produces no accumulation. It just doesn't. Crazy people and financiers will tell you that it does, and some Italians. Crazy people, financiers, and Italians will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> 
that it does, they're ludicrously mistaken, and I will prove it, but some other time. Um, but so we see this massive increase in the fire economy, or that's finance, insurance, and real estate, the things that generate only nominal increases in value, but no actual increases. So like if I have a house, and I put it up for market, and you all think it's a cool house, and you start bidding on it, I bought it for $100,000, because I live in... I don't know. <laughs> Some place where houses still cost $100,000. And you all bid on it because you all want houses and you've all got good jobs with, uh, with Lehman Brothers. Yeah. Um, and, and you're psyched and you're doing really well and you start bidding on my house and its price goes up and someone buys it for $500,000. Well, that's $400,000 more in an economy that weren't there before. Is there more stuff in the economy? No. Is that nominal value subject to vanishing overnight if there's a bust? Yes. <laughs> It's purely fictitious capital. It's not real accumulation. And this is true of all the things in the fire sector. And so you see this massive increase in the fire sector and decrease in manufacturing. They cross, you're not going to be surprised, shortly after the 1970s, in the 1970s, uh, that transition point that I was talking to you before about the shift from production to circulation. And one last way to look at it, this is about containerization, right? So another sort of strategy of circulation uh, to ship goods faster and faster. And like, we can think about finance and circulate and, and shipping, very interestingly, as like two sides of the same phenomenon. What they do is move money and goods faster and faster. They accelerate the speed of money and the speed of goods without increasing their profitability. In fact, they try to address decreased profitability, right? The problem is I make widgets, my profit rate is going down on widgets for various reasons, mainly automation. Um, and so I need to sell more and more widgets to, to make my profits, right? Because I'm making less money per widget. So what do I do? Well, I increase my production scale, which is where finance comes in. I borrow a bunch of money from a bank so I can increase my production scale. And two, I want to ship them faster and faster. So I support the global build-out of shipping and other kinds of circulation technologies. And you see massive increases of those that go exactly with the decline in manufacturing. Manufacturing profits go down. Circulation technologies, shipping being the most obvious example, go up. So there's other ways to look at these massive shifts to circulation. Automation is probably one of the main ways to look at it. Um, the things that are happening in this, in this period where you're seeing more and more people displaced from uh, jobs via automation. Um, that's one of the ways to describe that decrease in who is doing what kind of job, right? These jobs are vanishing to robots. People are going somewhere. Are they all going into service? Not all of them, and we'll come back to that. I actually love this picture. It's a little hard to make out. But <laughs> these are all big red robots making cars. There's like one person superintending them. Like That's their remaining job, but that's not the great thing. The great thing is that the one remaining person has decided to dress like the robot. <laughs> um, there's, there's something about that picture I find so moving and powerful. It's like, maybe they'll keep me if I blend in. <laughs> So that's one way to talk about the changes that are happening. Another is massive finance collapse. So I gave you all jobs at Lehman Brothers, except Lehman Brothers doesn't exist anymore. They go out of business in 2008 with the financial collapse, yeah. from which we have still not recovered. Um, so that collapse of finances, are sort of the, the, the sort of investment in finance, and then the collapse of it is one way to think about this. Um, here's my favorite recent image from the endless genre of like sad pictures about the shipping industry. Um, this is like one cargo container on a huge shipping uh, vessel. Um, so these are, these are some ways to uh, look at this, this shift to circulation that I'm calling it. So the shift to circulation has two senses that I want to stress. One is the capital shifts into circulation. I've already talked about that a bit, right? So I'm not making very much money by manufacturing the widgets themselves. I've replaced all my workers with robots. I'm not getting surplus value from my workers. Um, so I'm going to invest in circulation strategies, whether that be borrowing money from the bank to increase my production scale in automation, which I'm compelled to do to keep up with, my, with the other car makers or sweater makers or whatever, um, uh, whether it's investing in shipping, whether, all these various strategies to compete for profits in circulation. Because if you and I both make widgets, you look like a competent widget maker, right? And we're both 
totally automated. We can't, like the widgetator 5000, there's no, not any better one than that. We're down to like one worker and 400 widgetators. We can't improve things there. How are we going to compete? Well, we're going to compete to sell more widgets more efficiently out there. So I'm going to try and cut down my circulation costs. I'm going to um, speed up how fast I can circulate widgets and try and decrease my cost of bookkeeping, the most classic circulation job in the world. All bookkeepers do. Bookkeeper, that's, this is the most magic job in the world. I know you thought it was something cooler than that. Bookkeeping is the most magic job in the world. All they do is cause commodities to move conceptually. They don't even move physically, right? Like, there's a commodity there and a commodity there, and people sell them to each other, and it happens like the bookkeeper checks it off. And like, now that person owns that one, and that person owns that one. This sort of magic motion, um, which involves no real physical motion at all, and the bookkeeper is the person who superintends that. It's pure circulation work. But it costs money, right? Capitalists have to pay money for bookkeepers, even though bookkeepers cannot generate any profits themselves. So we start to try and cut down on those costs. You start exploiting your bookkeeper even more than I do, and we're involved in a stupid circulation war. And it's not increasing our profits. Well, it is, because it's decreasing our costs. But it's not increasing our, our production of surplus value at all. There's no production happening at all in our stupid circulation war. There's just cheapening of costs in circulation. So you or I get a little advantage in profit, and we don't give a shit that we're not having any production happening until the economy collapses entirely. Then you'll give a shit. When it turns out there's only bookkeepers <laughs> and robots, which is where we're headed, right? People talk about wealth polarization. And so being only bookkeepers, we can call them tech bros, but really they're bookkeepers. Um, there's only bookkeepers and robots, and then incredibly low-paid service workers and then a vast number of them. So that's one way to think about the shift to circulation, but there's another, which is the shift of bodies to circulation. Right? Capital moves into circulation, but so do bodies. Humans that were employed, that had a wage, that were production-centered, that might have been strikers, move into circulation. They're still market-dependent, but they no longer have a wage. They're displaced almost without fail, not by offshoring, not by globalization, but by automation. We see a massive displacement of people from the wage, from the formal wage, into the informal sector. Because people still have to stay alive. So they still do work, but it's a secondary access to the wage. Right? That's what informal, or tertiary, that's what informal work is. So the classic examples I give, or used to give until I got in a big fight with someone in Sweden, <laughs> um, are like, if you cut hair in your front room informally. So like, if I do that, I cut your hair, I don't have access to the wage myself, I have access to your wage, right? So I have a secondary access. You're drawing a wage, from, you're a widget maker. Good job. <laughs> um, and you're getting a wage and I'm not getting a cut of it for doing this informal work. Similarly, sex workers, drug dealers, people who sell Lucy's on the street corner like Eric Garner, right, who gets killed for it. Um, these are all examples of informal labor that isn't productive, doesn't generate surplus value, has no direct access to the wage. So that's one way of thought that people who are shifted into circulation market dependent, but do not have direct access to the wage. None of the people I just described can strike. You see the logic pretty well now, right? This massive shift in the circulation means the strike has to come to an end and that riots have to uh, come to the fore. So let's just take a look at a couple of numbers before we finish off, uh, a, little, a little bit of uh, uh, the numbers. So here's some data. You won't be able to see it very well, but I'll talk you through it. These are third world megacities. This is data from Mike Davis's Planet of Slums, a crucial book, but he's probably the only person who works on this. Jan Brayman is probably the best scholar on this happening in Asia, uh, which is a big place for it. So between, from 1950 to 2004, Mexico City went from three to 22 million. Seoul, Injon, from one to 22 million, and so on. Sao Paulo, one of the great sort of locuses, or loci if you prefer, of, uh, of wealth polarization in the world. It goes from 2.4 million to 20 million. This is just people living there, but maybe a more salient uh, bit of data is how many of these people do not have direct access to the wage. People are in the informal sector. So currently in Mexico City, four million people not, with, uh, not with, without direct access to the wage. And these numbers, these, these are places with at least a half million people in the informal sector around the globe. There's a vast number. We've seen a massive shift in the last 40 years of people out of the formal wage sector into the informal wage sector, or, to or into total unemployment. Well, that's very hard to deal with. Which is to say, 
that first shift when agriculture collapsed and everyone was absorbed by industry has actually not happened. The collapse of industry has not meant that everyone was absorbed by the service sector. Some people were absorbed by the service sector, but many, many have moved into informal sectors, which is to say have become, from having been the population of strike, the population of riot. So with that, we can return, as we'd like to do at the end of things, to where we started, which is an image of a nationwide protest that we had in Ferguson too. This is a map, CNN's map. It's a pretty good one of where all those protests, all those blockings of highways happened. And as I'm sure you noticed, the blocking highways question got answered 26 minutes ago. Right? It turns out that that form of blocking highways has been the basic form of the riot since the 14th century. Right? Because riots are circulation struggles. Riots involve getting in the space of circulation. Now, it's been abstracted. Right? When those freeways get blocked in 2014, it's far more an abstract activity than blocking the guy with the grain and saying, give us your grain. There's been a real transformation in the significance uh, or the concreteness of that act, but the form has remained. The form of the circulation struggle has been fairly persistent on and off for centuries. So let's look a little bit at this map, and I want to compare it now to a different map, which is a map of the great migrations. Right? These are the moments when uh, black Americans move from the agricultural sector to industrial cities in various places. So here's maps of the two great migrations at the beginning of the century and the mid-century. That second map corresponds to the long boom um, where you see this great uh, sort of shift. In fact, let's look at a little more detail. You can see the second great migration and the map of where those Ferguson two protests essentially correspond almost entirely. Now, in some ways, we shouldn't overvalue this correspondence. It's like that's where the cities are. <laughs> um, kind of almost every city had a riot. But the correspondence is actually a bit more close to that, and there's reasons for it, right? So you get this departure from agriculture into industry in these cities uh, during the Great Boom, and then you get deindustrialization. It happens in these cities. It happens earlier than you think. We often talk about it as a phenomenon from the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. Deindustrialization in the United States, which is to say a declining percentage of the population working in industry. Industry is still very productive, right? But they're just using fewer and fewer employees. They're doing this shift of bodies out of industry, out of manufacturing, into circulation. It actually starts in 1958 in the most early industrializing, industrializing cities. Newark is where it starts first. Newark starts to deindustrialize in 1958, Detroit in 1960. Chicago very shortly after that. These are the first sources of deindustrialization where you get people being moved from the manufacturing sector into either service or the informal sector, which is to say moving from strike to riot. And it turns out this move is almost entirely racialized. There's lots of reasons that it's racialized. As you can see, right, it tracks the great migration of black workers. They come to these cities late. Moreover, there's racist union policies that make it difficult for African Americans to join unions, illegal in some cases. These are finally overcome in the 1920s for the first time. The first major African American led strike is 1943 in River Rouge. Uh, so the arrival of uh, African Americans to these industrial cities and to these labor unions comes late, and thus their departure comes early via the basic last hired, first fired policies which these unions all organized by. So when deindustrialization starts in 58, 60, it's entirely racialized. So the shifting of people from production to circulation happens along racialized lines. So you get surplus populations that are racialized uh, populations almost entirely. And this gives us a way to think, at the end now, uh, about the riots we've been having since the 1960s. Right? We've identified them as race riots. That's a terrible name. There's at least two reasons it's a terrible name. One, the history of racialized riots in the United States was for the longer period, 1880s to 1950s, white populations attacking populations of color uh, toward increased subordination over and over again. And when we talk about race riots and we immediately think of black people rioting in walks or something, we forget that history. And that's a real issue, right? But the other issue is we don't want to take race as this sort of essentialized, basic, obvious fact. Right? We, we, we tend now to be fairly persuaded, as I am, by these modes of thinking of racial ascription and racialization. Uh, you know, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, one of the great scholars of this, describes 
uh, racialization as the um, production of and vulnerability to early death um, done by the state or by the economy. And that, that is the process of racialization. Uh, and so this racialization that happens um, uh, is concomitant with this shift of people from production to circulation. They're the same fact. They're the same fact. And this allows us now to sort of complete a long arc, right? What relationship can we see between the first era of riot and riot prime? The thing that joins them together is essentially market dependence without wage dependence. It turns out they're both circulation-based kinds of struggles by people who've been moved into the space of the market without access to the wage. But it turns out in the second period, that population is a racialized population, and so it appears as a racialized struggle. Now, when I say appears as, I don't, want to, I don't mean to suggest it's not really that. Of course it is. It's a racialized struggle that also has the logic of a production struggle. That's why I refer to it as surplus rebellions. Right? It's the people who've been made surplus to the needs of economy and the state, and yet somehow still have to be managed. Uh, of course, they get managed famously by increasing incarceration. Uh, I'm sure you've seen numbers of incarceration of African Americans since the 70s going up in an arc like that. Um, but it corresponds exactly to that moment, right? Because blackness doesn't get invented in the 70s. The shift to circulation happens in the 70s, right? The massive surplusification happens in the 70s, and it's at that point that all these racialized management strategies take effect. So these two phenomena, the shift to circulation and racialization, are essentially inseparable, entangled phenomena. And that's why we start to see uh, the shift toward what we'll call, again, unfortunately, race riots starting in the 1960s. It will turn out, you will not be surprised to hear, that the biggest race riots of the 60s are where? New York, Detroit, Chicago. The first industrializing, the first deindustrializing cities in the U.S. And that's where we'll pick up again tomorrow, talking about those riots. Uh, this is a great image from Detroit. The very last thing I will note before we uh, have some time for questions is this sort of fundamental inversion that's happened between the first era of riot and the second era of riot that makes them so fundamentally different, despite their similarities. As I alluded to earlier, and sort of made be clear. One of the puzzles of the contemporary riot is why it does not have a, a, as overtly an economic characteristic as the first era of riots did. And I think we can talk about this really interesting historical inversion. I should first note that there is still some price setting in contemporary riots, right? It's called looting. People act as if looting is this terrible aberration and a great moral mistake. In fact, people will sometimes suggest if only the rioters hadn't looted, we'd have some respect for what they did. That's a lie. No one's ever going to sit around and have respect for riots. This is like utter bullshit that liberals say. But, um, but people present it sort of unaware of the fact that looting is the absolute truth of riots. Right? It's, looting is what riots always were. The earliest riots are looting, 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 and looting. Uh, and so the looting we see in contemporary riots is not some sort of mistake or aberration or errancy. It's the sort of uh, logical kernel of the riot itself. However, we've seen this historical change, right? If you go back to 1600, 1500, we can describe the situation sort of schematically as such. The economy is very near. The things you'd need for your subsistence to reproduce yourself, they're probably all made within 25 miles of where you live, maybe less. It's imaginable that you could sort of lay hold of the economy and reproduce yourselves that way. On the other hand, the state is far, right? There's no police. Unless you're in a garrison town, there's no standing army. There's like a couple beetles, a bailiff, who knows, right? So you have economy near, state far, and that structures what the riot attacks. In the present, the situation is reversed, right? There are police on every corner. The state is near all the time, but the economy is far. It's been globalized through endless supply chains, spatial divisions of labor, sort of been aerosolized, so that things are made across vast chains, across 11 countries of assembly and delivery and final sale. The idea that you could sort of lay hold of the economy and support yourself, no longer a, a conceptual horizon. On the other hand, as soon as you leave the door, you're going to encounter the state. And so circulation struggles now in this historical inversion have little choice but to pitch themselves directly at the state. And they do, over and over again. And you might say, that would thus be a, not the, 
fundamental question for a discussion on Wednesday, which would be how to overcome that barrier and have kinds of rebellions, insurrectionary struggles turn themselves not just toward the state, but also toward the economy and what that would mean and what that would look like. Thank you very much. Um, some people have to leave. Thank you for staying. If you want to stay uh, and ask questions, I'm here all week. Uh, <laughs> I see one hand already. You've been digging, you've been like, done to answer a question, ask a question for a while. I've, I've seen a rising in you. What do you got? Um, actually, I have two distinct questions. Okay. So one is, how do immigrants fit into this story? Uh, especially given you know, that's a fairly significant issue these days. Um, but just even confining it to the United States or discussing Europe in that regard, um, how does it fit into this pattern of both how that those bodies that are shifting are treated and how that then translates into this sort of broad set of trends that you're describing mm -hmm. with respect to striking and, and rioting? It seems to me that, in fact, if, if the labor movement in the United States, for example, has had any sort of rejuvenation, Ju uh, uh, well, it, we're making um, up words is totally yeah, on the table. Right. Go I'm, for it. I'm losing my mind right now. But the, uh, if, it's, if it's had any kind of revival, it's thanks to immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's, it's near extinction nonetheless. Uh, so that, I mean, you can handle that question any way you want and make it sound more intelligent than I just made. The other question is, you used a word just now, two words, insurrection and rebellion, that have been largely absent from the talk. And I'm wondering, you know, I mean, I've heard lots of people talk about riots, and very often they get challenged for using that term, precisely because it has such a pejorative character to it. Mm -hmm. When in fact, I mean, I'm personally more sy sympathetic to the notion that these are rebellions. Mm -hmm. So those are my two questions. Yeah, those are, that'll keep us here for a while. Um, those are good questions. I'll try and answer them effic efficiently enough so that you'll feel a little bit cheated, but we can always talk more later. Um, <laughs> The, the immigrant question is a complicated one. Um, it's definitely part of the story. As you intimated, it works differently in different places. So before I talk about the US, I'll sort of make a gesture to how amazing Sweden is. I, just, I went through Scandinavia this summer, so these things are sort of on my mind. But the Swedes, any, there's probably some Swedish people here. This is Wisconsin. I know there's a <laughs> certain, certain immigrant tradition. Uh, um, extremely convinced of the exceptionality of their own history in relation to almost everything, because this includes, includes riots. And in fact, they've had the most schematic history imaginable. So their immigrations in Sweden have been entirely about managing labor markets. So at exactly the moment of the shift from production to circulation, in 1973, Sweden changes its immigration laws. So they'll take political um, exiles or refugees but not labor refugees, and they manage their labor market that way and thus avoid riots until, well, it turns out there start to be immigrant riots in, as if by magic, 2008 with the economic crisis, they suddenly arise, 2008, 2009, 2013, Stockholm, Gothenburg, Malmö, the three big cities, right? It's been so schematic um, how it worked in Sweden, and that gives you some sense of, of how directly and clearly the sort of trajectory of immigrants and labor management pools fits with this schema. Now, the US is a more complicated story. Like One of the ways we would probably want to talk about it is I touched on, and I'm sure you're sort of familiar with the concept of the tendency toward increasing productivity through automation in most sectors. This happens in high-wage nations, of which the US is notably a high-wage nation. But one of the ways it tries not to be a high-wage nation is by allowing openly and tacitly all kinds of extremely low-wage immigration to happen. We're having a presidential election about this at the moment. Uh, that, among other things, like who gets to press the button on the drone, the other seems the other big question. Um, and, uh, um, and so you have some sectors that are still relatively low-wage because of immigrant, uh, immigrant work, and they become more labor-intensive, right? So you have um, machine-intensive in sectors where wages are very high, obviously, uh, and labor intensive where labor costs are very low. And so sectors where labor costs are low are where you still get strikes, which is where you get immigrants, right? Immigrants, low, low wages, labor intensive sectors, possibility of strikes. It's fairly clear 
Uh, but there's probably other things involved as well. Different countries really have different trajectories of relation to kinds of labor struggles and places where people come from and come to here. Interesting things uh, happen and sort of ideologies around kinds of struggle. There are some cultural differences there, but as you could guess from my approach, that cultural difference is not my leading indicator. It's sort of a, a, a way to think about how people ex experience these things. But yeah, I think that it makes sense that the, the kind of strikes we will see um, over, the, over the near horizon are going to be A, involve immigrants quite frequently, but B, be in the sphere of circulation, right? Because it's in circulation that you've seen more and more labor services and things like that. As people leave, they get pushed out of manufacturing, pushed out of industry, pushed out of extraction, and so on, and pushed into service work, it's in those spaces that you're more and more likely to see strikes, including effective strikes. So we think about effective strikes in the U.S. over the last time horizon. The most effective has been the UPS strike, right, pure circulation. Teacher strikes, also not in the productive sphere. Mandel would call that Department 3, but right, it's, it's a non-productive sector. And that's where we've seen successful strikes. Um, uh, whereas in the traditional manufacturing sectors, almost none. Uh, so I think, again, I'm not trying to argue in this book that like strikes disappear, but they shift to circulation, as does everything else. Uh, oh, right. Your second, yeah, your second question was, oh, that's it. Yeah, so this is a fair debate. I guess, I mean, I'm more interested in exactly the inverse, which is to say, instead of saying like, oh, those aren't riots, those are rebellions and insurrections. And this is always a fight people have, right? Detroit goes up, it goes down, and then people fight about what to name it. Was it really an insurrection? Was it a rebellion? Some people call it the Great Detroit Riot, some people call it the Great Detroit Rebellion. There's lots of fights about it. I'm in some sense more interested in, not rescuing is the wrong term, but like transcoding the term riot itself. Instead of saying like, oh, I admit riots are bad and messy and chaotic, and evil, um, and we don't want those, which is generally strangely agreed upon on both, like, both the, the right and the left. Um, like, left condescension towards riots is one of the more repugnant phenomena that, that one can encounter when one studies these things. Uh, but um, instead of saying, like, we don't want those, like, I'm sort of interested in saying, actually, the riot is just like a way people have fought throughout history. It's what class struggle looks like in various places in various times. And this is important to say. I'm like, let's just say it. A riot is what class struggle looks like. You have this trajectory of capital, right? Where first capital's antagonists are outside of production. The first antagonists of capital are not laborers. They're people who don't want to labor, who are opposed to being brought into the wage. And capital succeeds in bringing them in, internalizing them right into production. Capital internalizes its own antagonists, and that happens for a prolonged period of time, and it sort of peaks at its capacity to do that sometime in the 20th century, and then it starts externalizing again. It starts externalizing its own antagonists out of production and back into circulation. And then that's the riot, but that's still class struggle. And I think if we could name it as that, instead of having a super like ortho, Marxist, Leninist model of like class struggle as only um, a very select, narrow, white male industrial worker. Um, if we could like rethink what class struggle is and has been and is becoming, we'd be a lot better off in puzzling over these problems. So in that sense, I do want to just transcode riot from its moral evaluation to understanding what it is as a thing that people have done to, to um, try and confront the particular um, immiserations that they've suffered. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so re reading your, uh, when I started your book, um, basically I'm uh, totally, totally buying your, your thing, and I, I find the world systems thing like really useful. Um, but the book that I was thinking about when I was reading yours was um, Poor People's Movements by uh, Howard and, uh, Howard. and uh, Francis Fox Finnan. And the way they talk about, like they don't use, you know, they don't talk about riot, but they do talk about you know, this kind of like spectrum of escalation, mm -hmm. you know, right? Boycott, strike, loot, burn. Uh, and it's, it's- BSLB, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good movement. It's, it's like this different framework from what, how you're thinking, you're talking about mm -hmm. all this stuff. Um, but the way they, the, the way they put these things on like a spectrum of, of escalation within, a, within the context of a struggle mm -hmm. is really useful mm -hmm. as like, you know, as like, 
for like thinking of movement strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how, do, how do you, how do you, do you, can you say something about like the way you're, you're approaching your whole like historical analysis and then the way they're talking about it as like political science and strategy people? Yeah, I can say something. It's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I mean, as you say, that's a useful, um, that's a useful book. Right? That's an important and significant book. I'm reading it. It was very, um, thought-provoking to me and useful in various ways, maybe persuasive in the, in the time. And I do want to insist, um, like, the two things, like the, whatever, is it ego and superego or something? Like, I want to insist at once that, like, I'm right. But that also, um, there's lots of ways to think about this set of problems and different frameworks that allow you to narrativize it and think through what's going on, and different ones will be useful in different ways. And so I don't feel myself in, like, sort of antagonistic, conceptual terrain to um, Thurman and Cloward, I do think that their approach has a, some presumptions in it that are not mine. The presumptions have to do with what is organization, um, and they're presumptions that come from an old left tradition, so that in fact, I'm not, blaming, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is true of them, but it's true of many people sort of on the labor left that organize as an imperative means a very specific, very narrow activity um, of which sort of the, the cliched version is like agitating in the factory, selling newspapers in the corner, right? And, and, um, and they come from the question like, well, how do you organize? What would you organize? How, how, how could that work? These are interesting questions. Um, and I have two, like, two things to think about that. One, I think that's a less powerful force historically than they think it is. I tend to think that we can make an accounting of these historical transformations and how people struggle, which doesn't have very much to do with individual consciousness as a people who think they're organizing people in a kind of I think you can tell a story pretty well without um, crawling into the space of mediate, of like conscious mediation, right, and, and worrying about how it works. Also, I think there's been a specific historical change, right, which is that the presumptive mode of organization on which they're based. And they're not doctrinaire the way that certain kind of like ortho, you know, ortho Leninists are or whatever. Um, but I think that the kind of org political organization that was available to imagine in the earlier 20th century, which we usually sum up with the phrase class mass party sequence, right, of organizing a specific class around their class position into a mass party that conceives the means of production. Um, uh, adopt a program for the transfer for the transformation and eventually wither, withering away of the state, and you know the deal, right? But that trajectory of how organization could happen is now uh, vacant. It's, 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 been, it's been evacuated. It's not possible. The kind of transformations in global class composition that I'm pointing out have made that impossible. So, like a couple of brief notes. I realize I'm wandering a bit far from your question, but it's useful for me to be able to say these things. So, people often talk about like. Well, but isn't China a place where you could have that sequence? Workshop of the world, super industrialization in a way that we're not anymore. The answer to that question is no. Um, for one thing, despite what you've heard, uh, employment in industry manufacturing in China is decreasing, service is increasing. For another thing, because it sort of increases improvements in productive technology in the 20th century, China at its peak didn't have anything close to the industrial manufacturing employment that the US or Japan or Germany did, not even close. 50% of it. So um, that particular model, which I think is somewhat presumed um, as a horizon, but not the only one in Piven and Cloward, I think it's really important to say yeah, that's just not, that's probably foreclosed. And we need to think about other things that in fact may not take the word organization very effectively. That's not to say people want to do coordinated things. I don't want you to hear me making some sort of groovy West Coast moon bat argument for horizontalization and total leaderlessness. I'm not saying that. People get together and agree to do things all the time. Groups of five matter. Groups of 12 matter. Groups of 100 matter. Whether there can be a class mass party sequence in the way there used to be, I don't think there can. So I'd like to renegotiate, just as the term riot, what organization might refer to. And that would be where I'd sort of want to argue with them. It's like when they talk about organizing, at what level and scale are they imagining their horizons and how does it work? And I think that's a debate worth having, but that's an important book. Sorry, long answer. Yeah.
Uh, I was wondering, so maybe kind of what we just at the end of your talk too, but why is it that this era of riot crime as coming from this uh, movement of deindustrialization, why is the direct cause of so many riots uh, police violence and not, say, like a factory shutdown on those lines? Ah, yeah. Um, direct cause is the trick there, right? So. Um, Here's some things that are worth noting. First of all, it's obviously correct, right, that the, the um, paradigmatic way that the, this, what I'm calling a surplus rebellion or the riot prime begins is when the cops or cop surrogates um, kill usually a black kid. And this is not just true in the U.S. The language of race and ethnicity works differently in different places, but if you look at right, Mark Duggan in England or... Um, the two kids who get killed by the cops in France to set off the 2005 riots and so on. Utterly consistent. Um, a couple things worth noting. Actually, sorry, actually is always the sign something's gone terribly wrong, right? <laughs> um, it's worth bearing in mind that even though our recounting of bread riots and export riots, as I call them, where they block the road, focus on that activity, riots in the first period of riot are also very often set off by state violence against a, um, against a person, often a young person. This happens over and over again. Uh, it's not a new phenomenon. Second of all, here's a fantastic fact. The cops, and if you, if, if you hear me defending cops here, any of you who know me will recognize that's not what's happening. The cops are actually not killing black kids faster than they used to. We all love to keep track of the numbers now, and there's websites that do it. They're not killing them faster. They always killed them crazy fast. <laughs> always. So why does it set off riots now when it didn't before? What are the variables, we have to ask, that caused that event to now cause a riot where it didn't? Well, the main, the main variable, I think, is um, that it happens in a community where the levels of discipline and immiseration are much higher. So, the thing that's changed in these communities is not the frequency of cops killing kids, it's rates of incarceration. Communities where you have a vast number of people who have been incarcerated, who have antagonistic relationships with the police, who are, who are always subject to police discipline, who are always already hostile to police, having already had concrete encounters with them, these are where riots happen. So we'd have to ask, why does that happen? Why do we have this increasing discipline in these communities? And I tried to gesture at that story before, right? That the management of these populations via incarceration, again, I want to strongly recommend Ruth Wilson Gilmore's book, Golden Gulag, one of the great books that I've ever read, which is about uh, black incarceration in California and political economy since the 70s. Golden Gulag by Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Fantastic book. Uh, and that gives an account of what she calls the four surpluses. Um, surplus capital, meaning capital that has no place to go to be invested and just hang around, it's a sign of a stagnant economy. Surplus population, surplus land, and uh, there's a fourth surplus, surplus capacity uh, in factories. And those conditions are the conditions in which riots happen uh, in, these, in these communities. So the instantiating event, you're right, is that. But it, the fact that that instantiating event causes a riot, as opposed to not, as often happens as well, right? That can probably be attributed to other factors, which are at the intersection of racialization and surplusification. That caused both of you to raise your hand. Yeah, either one of you, back row. Oh, yeah. So my question is about informal labor, mm -hmm. um, which you talked about. And I'm having a hard time conceptualizing how that's happening on a really broad scale. Like, I kind of bristled when I heard that we're maybe not in like a wage-dependent uh, era anymore. Um, being a semi-unionized graduate student, uh -huh. um, and I'm thinking, so I'm thinking of my generation, I'm thinking of millennials, and what I'm seeing are a lot of people with um, sort of contributing wage-dependent labor, but also having a side gig, like a supplementary side gig that mm -hmm. comprises this informal labor that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, do, is that statistically significant to what you're talking about? And then secondly, just to hear more maybe examples of informal labor and how that contributes to your argument. Mm. Yeah. <coughs> um, so again, the first thing I should say is, is nod to the important scholars of this field who have better things and more things to say about it than I would. Again, I would like I would look at Jan Bremen, um, 
as, as one person, B-R-E-M-E-N. He's not the only one. There's a team of four Brazilians who've written extensive studies of this. I can give you, I'm not going to rattle off the names now, especially because my pronunciation of Portuguese is bad. Uh, but I'd be happy to provide them to you if you're curious. So, uh, some things about data. First, um, the majority of people still work for a formal wage. I did not mean to suggest that's not the case. Although, fewer than people think, right, labor force participation in the United States is about 59%, um, which is like lower than you thought, right? And that's how many people are able to work. We're like 59% if you use U6, which is the relevant statistic. If you're going into unemployment dynamics, there's like U1 through U6. And like the usual data you get doesn't include people who simply stop looking for work. It only includes people who are trying to find jobs actively in the last six months. Huge population of people who are not, people who are in prison, all these kinds. So U6 is the number you want. Labor force participation, it's at about 59%. So quite a bit lower than it once was. Um, and so the question of like, what's the magic point at which like labor force participation gets low enough that we can talk about this shift from production to circulation? And it's true. I mean, I think that one of the things I would concede that's implicit in your question is, I've sort of done a little bit of a, what some data as stocking horse for other data, which is to say the shifts in like profitability and net, net profits and systemic accumulation for capital as one way of thinking about that shift as opposed to pure data about like pure, uh, pure employment data. Um, and it's true, I sort of don't conflate them, but, but entangle them a, a little bit. But so there's been a de uh, substantial decline in labor force participation and uh, at some point um, in that decline, we saw a meaningful shift in how capital imagines itself and what it thinks is worth investing in from technologies of production to technologies of circulation. Uh, but yeah, most, like the majority of people still have shitty jobs that they get paid shittily for and have to figure out how to navigate. Okay. Um, <laughs> good news. But, but that's the crazy thing, right? Which is to say, how do we feel about that? Um, when I think about you know, the Piven and Cloward, I think about this great poem by Diane de Prima, dedicated to the poor people's movement, that begins, if what you want is jobs for everyone, you are still the enemy. But in that question of like, are we trapped into a defensive struggle to desperately protect our shitty jobs? Or are we trying to imagine an emancipatory horizon where like shitty jobs are not the dream <laughs> <laughs> that, we, that we fight for? Um, and that's largely the story of union struggles in the last 40 years, right? It's purely defensive struggles, um, not just like, can we minimize how much our pay cut is going to be, a classic example of a defensive struggle, but what do we have to do to keep this company in business so we still have jobs, right? Which is the main union negotiation of the last 40 years, and that's a pure defensive struggle. Um, in terms of what informalization is, again, I look at the Bremen, and these South South Pop, but there's many, many things, right? The United States still has some unemployment benefit, right? But most of the world doesn't have unemployment benefits. So if you don't have a formal access to a wage, and I assure you, labor force participation is in some countries higher than the US and in the majority of countries lower, globally. The chart goes about like that and the US is right there um, in terms of labor force participation. Uh, and, so, and some countries are as low as the 40s. Um, so in some sense, although we could list up uh, many, many different kinds of examples um, from the ones that feel very abject to us, like people who um, sort of race out to try and wash your windshield when you, when you when you're stop at an intersection, um, uh, to things that actually seem a bit more, um, a bit less abject in, in, in various kinds of ways, like, base, like basic services, like the person who will um, change your tires in the um, remaining ungentrified places in Brooklyn that are clearly tired, you know, it's, it's a real shop, but it's tires they've scavenged from places, they're not paying the IRS, it's not a formal business. So there's, there's a broad, 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 broad spectrum. But you have to understand that even if we don't detail what the specific jobs are, if you think about a country with no unemployment insurance, let's talk about Indonesia for a second, that has 43% of its population doing formal work, well, how is everyone else surviving? However they're surviving, that's what I'm talking about. Like, we don't even want to talk about Greece, where youth unemployment right now is 75%. And there's no unemployment insurance in Greece. So however those people are surviving, that's what I mean. Yes, you had a question. Uh, I have a question about where generational conflict fits into your framework. Ah. And I've got two periods in mind. One is the 60s, 
Yeah, I've heard of it. So much of the rioting or protesting that are used by students uh -huh. and directed against the older generation. Maybe. And the second is my own theory that I've had for about 15 years, which is sometime around 2020 or so, I think there's going to be another conflict in this country. I think your generation is going to say a big, mighty F you in my generation because we deserve it. Because of the death that we are putting on you, because of the environmental mess that is not being addressed, and so on. Now, will that happen? I have no idea. But if it did, we can hope. If, yeah, if it did, or something like that, and then also take the 60s as well, where does that mm. fit into what you are discussing? Yeah, so that's a complicated question. I mean, I wish, I wish my friend Phil Neal were here. Phil Neal is a, uh, he's a friend of mine, but he's also a scholar. He worked on the, there's, there's been two big uh, sort of cross-sectional data research projects on the history of riots that are going on right now. One is happening with Beverly Silver at Johns Hopkins. That's still in progress. Results are quite interesting. And the other is uh, called G-Delt. And my friend Phil Neal has worked on G Delt for quite a bit. And his, he has a very genera generationalized account of the history of riots. And he, he would give you a different answer than I would and a very interesting one. So you can find some of his stuff online, Philip Neal, N-E-E-L. Um, I think that talking about generations often risks a kind of dangerous conflation. Um, things often appear generational um, and and but then to decide they are involves imagining a kind of like Oedipal Aegon that um, has something to do with like the consciousness of like the millennials hate the, the, the generation of older people. And, and I'm, I'm actually not sure that um, that's the structure of consciousness. It's certainly, I mean, obviously, there's, there's a whole bunch of people who feel exhausted and annoyed by the boomers because... Um, because they have bad taste and feel and like and yet perpetually present themselves as beleaguered and like they really need Bob Dylan to get a Nobel Prize and whatever you know. But um, uh, I actually don't know if the sort of degree of consciousness around Oedipal generational struggle is the most effective way to narrate how these things happen. I'm not sure I would narrate that, that that's what the '60s were about. Although I was quite young at the time, um, so uh, I, I don't want to make it too many direct claims, but um, it's hard for me to imagine that the anti-war struggles were actually Oedipal and actually generational in that way, but they appeared that way, which is to say um, U.S. law requires you to be a certain age to start a war, <laughs> um, and as a result the war team looked a bit older than the anti-war team, but that's that's different from saying it's generational and about who has possession over what social resources and controls them and so on, which I think is one of the things you're, you're suggesting. That said, so those are my disagreements with you. That said, I want to offer a substantial agreement with you now. This struggle you see coming in 2020, it's already begun. I'm not sure it's generational, but it's super narratable. Um, and you, you referred to students, and I want to sort of back away from the category of student for a second, and then I'll come back to it, uh, which is to say I want to talk about the interesting class fractions and class alliance that was attempted during Occupy. Now, Occupy now looks to many like a great failure, to some a moment they want to cherish, the way that many 68ers cherish that moment. Uh, that said, I think it's an incredibly indicative moment. My experience of it was this, and I spent a decent amount of time in various Occupy encampments, mostly Oakland and some time in New York and various other places. Um, it was an attempt at a particular class alliance, which I'll describe as follows. On the one hand, a downwardly mobile middle class, right, which we have for the first time in the history of the nation. The first time in the history of the US we have a downwardly mobile middle class who's experiencing a loss of privilege, a possible loss of future, and I think this includes the students. I realize students of themselves, if you're undergraduates now, or even graduate students, um, one doesn't feel like one is the achieved middle class of like, I have my home in the suburbs and my flat screen TV or whatever, but essentially that's the middle class position, right? However, for the first time, you have a generation of students who are profoundly aware, profoundly aware that the future is largely foreclosed. That the trajectory of being internalized to the wonders of capital that will deliver accumulation and increase to them, not there. So that's a sense of a middle class with a foreclosed future 
downwardly mobile, is one class fraction. And the other class fraction is a racialized population of the truly immiserated, people who've been utterly excluded already um, uh, and know it. And they're not like, oh, I'm not going to get the bright future that was promised me, but like, oh, what is this bright future you speak of? My people don't know it, right? Um, they're already entirely excluded. And Occupy was an attempt for those two class fractions to come together. Now, it didn't work. The main reason Occupy failed was aggressive state repression, right? That's by far the main reason. That said, that attempt at a class alliance between those two positions failed. It may not always fail, because that thing you're talking about in 2020, that's what I would describe as the onward declining trajectory of what you see as a generation and I see as, <coughs> I don't know, a sociological class or something, something like that. But it's generationally marked, for sure, absolutely for sure. And that position that that generation or class holds is going to become more and more tenuous, more and more precarious, more and more awful. Death's going to, exactly as you say, death's going to increase. The idea that it will ever be remedied is going to vanish entirely. And at that point, I think we'll see more intensified struggles. So in some sense, that drama you see coming, I think, has already begun. Um, I was just going to ask a question that is probably unfair because the book is so intensely working through the, the questions that you like put forward, which is this kind of Venn diagram between race and reproduction through circulation. And so it feels unfair to ask this question, but nonetheless, I've been really surprised that in listening to like um, interviews and, and other talks that it hasn't come up, which is kind of like the, the elephant in the room of, um, of domestic labor, of gendered labor, and that that is the, obvious, the other obvious population of those excluded from the wage historically. And so then the question becomes, does that matter for the historicization um, that you lay out? Does it also matter for imagining the possibility of what comes after um, this particular instance of collapse? And then it also you know, seems to beg a question of um, why that does um, domestic, those who work in domestic labor, um, do, they, do they riot? Um, like, do, do they riot in the terms that you're setting out? And, and if not, because in some ways it seemed like not, um, then why not? And what, what other forms of politics does that take on? Is it more like, like sabotage, which maybe like comes out in um, work on 18th century, um, kind of like gender domestic labor? Is it a sabotage form? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question to end on. Um, it really is, in some ways, the most important question to end on. And I agree, that's the thing missing from the book. Although, to be honest, the book is missing lots of things. I really chose very consciously to write a short book. I, um, for all the reasons you could imagine, laziness being, laziness being the, the crucial one. But also sort of the idea that I, in the end, I don't really believe you can prove things. So you should just like, here's my model, maybe it's useful. Like, that whole thing, like, you know, if you give me 900 pages, you will really truly believe there's such a thing as a categorical imperative. Like, what about me? Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, and, but I think that that is, like, were there to be a part two to the book, it's possible, I think, like, that would be where, where it would start. So there's some things to say about gender and reproductive labor, I think, that, that are basic but worth saying. One I already mentioned, right, which is that women often led riots in the first period of riot exactly because they were in charge of reproduction of the household. Um, and because that reproduction was market-based, like women, like, I just in a concrete sense, like I can use these abstract terms, circulation struggles and so on, but like who had to go to market and get enough goddamn food to keep the family alive and knew whether they had enough money to do that or not was women over and over again. And so women start these riots. So the history of riots is in many ways from its beginning a history of, um, that's mediated through what has traditionally been identified as women's work of uh, sort of practical reproduction of the domestic and of the, of, of the family itself. So what's the situation in the present? Well, that's still true in many places in the world, right? And uh, to, to a certain degree, why do we see less of that kind of riot? And I'm, I'm not sure that there's a self-evident answer to that question. It's important to me to stress that um, in the contemporary, more women riot than people think. That sort of cliche of, you know, the, as my friend said, the manarchist, right? That the, that the riot is this peculiar masculinist activity, um, racialized black, unless it's white anarchists who dress in black, something important about that, right? Um, uh, but it's always just like, you know, super masculine, aggro dudes rioting. Like, not according to the numbers. Like, a lot of women take part in riots, and, and that's worth holding on to. That said, I really want to take up your question of 
but what might come next? So here's a, I'm now going to expand my schema. So I, I, uh, early on, I suggested that reproduction through the market and reproduction through the wage are two, two modes of reproduction. But I also suggested toward the end that the riot is probably not a route toward successful reproduction, right? We can no longer seize the economy. If we want to seize the economy, we're going to have to seize the capacity to produce refrigerators. You know how many refrigerators got made in the United States last year? Zero. We don't make refrigerators in the United States. Like, that's just an example of why seizing the economy is a very hard thing to conceptualize now, um, seizing the market. So the vision of reproduction through the wage is vanishing. That's what the end of the labor movement means. The vision that we're going to seize the means of reproduction through seizing, seizing power over the wage we receive from capitalists is a declining historical trend line. And I will continue, I promise. Sue me if I'm wrong. But this return to the riot and the attempt to seize reproduction through the market will also reach its limits. It's also not possible. You can loot, right? But even if you're a very strategic looter and you've made very careful like, notes about the best things to loot and the most, like, highest number of calories like, and, and per, per pound and you loot very carefully, you survive for how long? Six weeks? Eight weeks? If I can carry on? Maybe? I think about this all the time. Uh, but that's a limit too, right? That's not going to do it. So what's the next reproductive struggle? It's going to have to be a struggle that does not involve a demand for the wage or a, a demand on the market, but some third mode of reproduction beyond wage or market. Now, that's the thing I call the commune. Like when I, talk, when I talk about a commune, that's all I mean. I don't mean exactly the Paris commune. I certainly don't mean nine hippies living in upstate New York. I mean um, that particular form of struggle which tries to solve the problem of reproduction without reference to wage or market. And that's, to me, what the route to emancipatory struggle will look like. And it seems to me inevitable that that will be a deeply gendered struggle, since that question of reproduction that's neither with reference to wage or market, that's, that's, that's the struggle that's gendered female. You think about the articles, right, from, from um, the production of gender, from endnotes, and, and those various arguments. They try to work through this exact puzzle of how that struggle is gendered female, um, uh, mostly successfully so. And so I think when we see that struggle, uh, it, we will see that as, as primarily, in the first instance, a struggle that has to take up the question of gender dramatically and radically, and will be organized around that. Uh, so, I hope, I, so I hope there's an opportunity to write part two of the book, because I hope to see more and more of those struggles. The last thing I'll say about that, because I would hate to send you out into the Wisconsin evening on an optimistic note, <laughs> is that I don't think that struggle will be particularly peaceful. Some people imagine, like, oh, that way, we just figure out how to subsist for ourselves. That reference to the wage or market, we'll just withdraw. And we'll, you know, we'll start growing quinoa. And, um, and we'll all withdraw, and we'll grow quinoa, and some people will grow kale. And eventually, capitalism will come to an end, and we'll have successfully withdrawn. That will literally never happen. When that starts to happen on a significant scale, a series of laws will be passed to make it illegal. Because what capital and the state working together as a unit do is compel people to participate and give up of themselves to capital and the state. And if people try not to, they'll change the laws, so you have to. It will look like something fairly benign, like private production, we're just going to raise the taxes on that 17%, or whatever it is, right? When people try to do that on a large scale, it will come into direct conflict with the capital-state nexus. And by direct conflict, I mean bloody conflict. So that struggle, which I'm calling by the cheerful name of the commune, is um, going to be serious and antagonistic and um, will involve commitment. And that commitment will be born of desperation, not of grooviness. Uh, and that's what we have to look forward to. All right, Mad Max. <laughs> um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it.